correct. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so folks, welcome. Welcome. Okay, I'm going to start the second meetup now. Um, it's going to be about center and periphery. This is a very, very deep theme of philosophy, psychology, religion. And this is something that really blew me away. Um, I've, I've been seeing this in the context of Tao Te Ching. It's very prominent in Tao Te Ching. And then it showed up in the Gospel of John. And then it showed up in really strongly in the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm going to be talking about it. And it's such a simple theme. It's about center and periphery and about what you focus on and the connection between those. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. So let me get uh, started. Uh, give me just a second. I'm going to get some water. Give me just a second. All right, folks. So let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. We're going to be talking today about a theme that keeps coming up in three of the meetups that we are working on. Tao Te Ching, Bhagavad Gita, and the Gospel of John. It's a very simple thing. I'm going to start off by describing how it appeared in these three works. I'm also going to add the fourth, that's Stoicism. And then I'm going to open it up for comments. It's a very simple theme. So I don't have any slides today because the slide would simply be a center and the periphery. That's the slide. So always think of that. Also, imagine yourself to be the center. So think of your heart, a spot behind your heart as the center, and then the whole world as the periphery. Okay, it works for all these, all these four conceptions. Okay. So what is, what is this thing? The most intense version of it I got was when I read chapter two of Bhagavad Gita. And there is a concept there called Stita Pradnya. Okay, what does Stita Pradnya mean? We have done a whole um, meetup on that. And Joe, whenever you get a chance, if you could put a link to that video, in the chat would appreciate that. So what we're going to do, is, so I'm going to start with that concept. What does Tita Pradnya mean? It holds, see Indian philosophy holds that each of us has a soul. It's called Atma. And that Atma, which is at the core of you, imagine it sitting just behind your heart. The idea of Stita Pradnya is that you stay at the center. You sit at the center of your wisdom. So that you are experiencing other things, but you're not distracted by it. You don't get attached to that. You remain at the center. So you look at everything from the center. You experience everything from the center. You act on the world from the center. So your wisdom is steady because it is at your core. So it's like the immovable mover. 
you are acting on the periphery. You are doing things. You are in the midst of action. But whether things are successful or not, whether there is pain or pleasure, whether there is, whether people like you or don't like you, those are happening at the periphery. You're noticing them, but you, you're at your core, you're not disturbed by that. You continue to function. Your wisdom continues to function in spite of that. That's the concept of sthita pranya. So that is the idea from uh, Bhagavad Gita. The idea from Tao Te Ching is expressed in many, many, many different poems. It keeps coming up. It's a, this is my favorite example of that. This is from verse 16. This is just an excerpt from verse 16. It says, the 10,000 things arise together. In their arising is their return. So all things in the world, they keep moving. You know, they arise from somewhere and then they return. Now they flower and flowering sink homeward, returning to the root. The return to the root is peace. Peace to accept what must be, to know what endures. In that knowledge is wisdom. Without it, ruin, disorder. So this theme of not being focused on the 10,000 things, not being focused on the colorful things that are happening, but keeping your attention on the Tao, understanding that nature has a certain law by which it operates. And wisdom lies in grasping that law and in acting in accordance with the law. It is quiet because you're trying to see, focus on the pattern, common pattern of nature. That is the center, Tao is the center and you are acting from the Tao. And when you do that, the result is what is called Wu Wei, which is action without taking action. It's because you're moving along a natural line of nature, not trying to bash through things. You're respecting the nature of things and in acting in accordance with that. So that is the Tao, Taoist concept of center. So Tao is at the center there are 10,000 things that are being produced, which is what we experience. Sage keeps focused on the Tao and acts from the Tao. So that is the Taoist version of it. Now let's go to the Gospel of John. In chapter four, when Jesus is talking to the woman from Samaria, he says, I will give you living water. And that living water will be a fountain in your heart from which will flow rivers of living water. What is that? It's basically the love of good, the love of God, love of the right way, sitting at the core of your heart and you acting from that. This is, this is description of the Holy Spirit. 
It is the love in your heart. What is it opposed to? What does it do? Is that you're turning away from the material things that don't come from the spirit. So that's what ends up washing away your sins. You're turning away from peripheral things which do not come from the center. So you are, this is the process of dying and being born again. All the things that are material, which in your life, which were there in your life, whether physical things, whether habits, whether emotions, those which do not act in accordance with this spirit, you're giving up. And you are acting from the spirit. And it's it then pours out in a river outside and it transforms the world. So this is the conception in Bible. Now, if you look at all these three, note that it is not center versus the periphery, but it is center driving the periphery. It is not either or. The periphery exists. In all these three, periphery exists. It's only when periphery acts against the center that is not in accordance with the center that it's a problem. In Gita, they talk about attachment as being the problem. Not experience, but attachment, where you are trying to hold on to the periphery and stop focusing on the core. The idea, the core idea is to focus, and the Indian conception is, is profound. What the, the idea is tatthomasi. So the the you have a God in you have God in you. It's the same as God. And you're focusing on that. What does Sri Krishna say in chapter uh, 12 and chapter 9 of Gita? He says, love the God within you. It's the same answer which is there in Bible. It's basically love of the core, the love of truth, love of goodness. And it is in you. In Bible, it talks about that you are, a you're being a child of God when you do that. You're becoming God-like. You are emulating Jesus. You're becoming part of the family of God. It's the same concept. And you interact all in all these three traditions, you interact. The sage in Tao Te Ching is interacting with the world. It is not about, it is, so the integration between center and periphery is integral to all three concepts. Let me quickly connect it to Stoicism. The dichotomy of control, which is the heart of Stoic thought. That's like, if you get dichotomy of control, you get about 80% of Stoicism. That's really the core of it. What is it? It is simply saying, what you can't control is in the periphery. Everything that you can't control is in the periphery. 
your soul, you, your Atma. That you can control. So you focus on that and you act from that. So I see this idea running through all these works. And it's such a simple idea. It's the simplicity of it that really strikes me. And that's why, though I'm doing three other meetups, I was eager to talk to you guys about it and see and hear from you. Because, you know, I was expecting to reach a point of seeing these kind of deep commonalities, maybe six months, one year from now. But already we are seeing, at least I'm seeing these profound, profound commonalities. These are not minor things. This is like the core of what Gita is trying to say. Be Sita Pradnya. This is core of what Tao Te Ching is saying. Act according to the Tao. Tao Te. The. The virtue. The way. Love God. Let the Holy Spirit flow in your heart. That's the core of the message of the New Testament. So this is all, all three are, this is pointing exactly to the core of all these three. So that's what I got from it. And I wanted to share that with you. And now I would like, especially to people of, who are familiar with any of these to talk about what they think of this idea. Any comments appreciated? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark to talk about what you get from, from this. I'm gonna start with um, Evanik. Evanik, go ahead. I think you hit it right on the head with all three. I think um, from knowing the Bible is, it really is about, I, I love what you said, first of all, about the center driving the periphery because instead of it being versus, because I think that's a very distinct point. And because when the center is driving the periphery, then you're not worried what people, how people are reacting to you. Uh, you're worried about what's going on inside. And when you're worried, and then when you're worried about, not worried about, but when you are acting from the center, you're acting from the God in you. And when you're acting from a godly perspective, um, what comes out needs to come out rather than your selfish ambitions. It, it's your love for other people that really come out. And you see it in actually all four. Um, uh, so the, with the Tao, you know, the, with the Tao, it talks about, um, you know, having that living water flow through you and the Bible and says the same thing and the Gita refers to it as well. It is from what's within you that comes out and affects the periphery, good or bad. So you get to choose. And I love this. You get the choice of listening to the God in you or listening to the ego. And um, I think with stoicism, which we, we just learned about, is really, it brings that point home for all three. It, I feel like stoicism is all almost like uh, the practical way of practicing this and that you're acting from your virtues and you're not um, acting from your concern about who's going to hurt me or how other people are going to react to this. You're acting from the virtues. So I think stoicism is the practical way of uh, applying all these three things, but I think you hit it nail on the head. I think, and the way you said it, it's just, it was really striking, especially um, because I think a lot of religions, not texts, but religions teach um, the center versus the periphery when it's actually the center driving the periphery. I think that was key. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanik. I want to follow up on one point, and that is that all these three talk about choice, that you have the ability of acting from the center. And that's the ability all three of them hold 
that you have that ability at every point of time. You can choose that anytime you want, every time, but you have to choose it. It is easy to be focused on the center. You know, the periphery will be making a lot of noise and it's easy to focus on it and to lose the center. Uh, but you have to like the way in which Bible says it is that you have to ask. If you do not ask, you do not receive. The way in which um, the Stoic tradition is explicitly about dichotomy of control, that you have to choose, you know, you have to have the courage to do the right thing. Um, the tradition in Gita, it's all about the form in which, you see, the other beautiful thing is that each of these traditions approach the problem slightly differently. And you can learn from each of them. For example, the Indian tradition focuses on direction of attention. They say, where is your attention? Are you going to pay attention to your center? Or are you going to pay attention to your periphery? Because everything kind of follows from that. Um, Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Prakash, followed by Joe. Prakash. Um, Srikant, I think you uh, answered part of my question, which I was <laughs> going to ask, but I will still repeat that. So um, I think it makes sense that you don't attach uh, to things that you do. You know, stay as calm. Don't go. Don't feel too um, elevated, too happy, or don't feel too sad. You try to be in the middle zone and keep on working. But the world around me is just too complicated. There is, there is a, you know, if everything is saying to me that you have to feel everything, you have to buy everything, you have to feel very, very happy, and some things are gonna make you feel sad, and you know, then you buy again something different that is gonna make you feel happy. Got it. So that's a, that's a daily challenge. So, thank you. I, I would like to know from you, you know, how, how to deal with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So. I would say that we live in a materialist world where it is all about using things to produce immediate emotions of the moment. And a lot of what goes on depends on that. All these three traditions are from a much older time of saying that this of being focused on the core is really what matters in life. It, by the way, is the same as virtue ethic. It is simply saying that that's what virtue is, to follow your nature, follow the truth, follow what is good, do what is good. That's all it is. That's, this, is this is another way of putting it is virtue ethic. This is virtue ethic. Whereas the modern, as somebody pointed out, virtue is a foreign concept uh, in modern time. It's not something that most people focus on. And absolutely, so we are, so it is challenging. And it's not as if it was never, it's always, there is always things at the periphery. Um, but most of the thinking about the virtue ethic is relatively weak in modern times. So uh, you're absolutely right. And you have to do that. And that means that this is an issue, which is a social issue too. Um, we are social beings. And what happens is that the other people are focused on the periphery. So the question is, are you going to remain focused on your core and the core of other people while the other lots of other people around you are focused on the periphery. And so in that sense, the, the social, the fact that we are social makes this issue more complicated, but the issue remains the same. It's just the scale is different. Um, all of this existed at Sri Krishna's time for, I mean, in some ways that context is far more challenging than today's context. We are in the, you know, Arjun is standing on the battlefield. It's a life and death issue. Christ is being 
stoned and being crucified. And he's talking about this in the middle of that. Uh, Lao Tzu is talking about giving up civilization and, and going into the mountains if need be. And those choices are actually a lot more easier to make, a lot more difficult to make than choices today. Uh, so, so I would, I, so that, that's what I would say. Uh, but a great question, uh, Prakash. Uh, next up is going to be Joe. So, I mean, I think you, you've really captured this well um, and that it is, uh, these are all virtue ethics. And, and what do virtue ethics do? They bring order to the chaos like that we're dealing with in our lives. And it brings you to the center. So it, it, it kind of, that's, that's the main thing that I'm thinking about. The one, I do have one question um, and I'm just trying to reconcile this out loud in my head. Um, so the God in me, it sees the God in you in Indian, uh, an Indian culture. I, and that resonates with me more than any, any, any of the others uh, in the sense that it's, I, th I see it a little bit different as seeing us all children of God, because I think that's a little external. Now, there, there's a truth that it's universal, but it is still an external God. And I, and I, and I see that kind of as being a little bit problematic as, as it's yes. kind of proven to be. Um, I, no, I, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm deliberately focusing on the commonalities. Okay, all right. And there are actually profound differences. But the commonalities I want to talk about first, um, but you're absolutely right. There are lots of differences, lots of differences actually, which are quite different. So let me quickly talk about the biggest differences that I see in these. So for example, in Bible, you're saying, you know, we are saying that Jesus is the way. This is the only way. You have to have faith in that. The Indian approach is very much focused on knowledge. You see, you figure out your center. There is center, but you have to figure it out yourself. Figure out God. Figure out, ask questions. If you don't understand, so the, the Arjuna and Krishna dialogue and the immense respect that Krishna has for Arjun for asking these questions and going back and forth. The direction is not one, one way. They're actually talking to each other. There are all kinds of different theories about what all of these mean. And they are not regarded as heretic. They are regarded as that all of these people are trying to figure it out. That's a very different tradition. The tradition in Taoism, Taoism are, is actually against words. They are against doing what the Indians are doing in using words to figure this out. And similarly, they're against the words that are being used in the Western tradition. So there is there are very, very deep differences in each of these things. And those differences are very real. And currently I'm focusing on trying to get the commonalities down, but absolutely. And so I encourage you to, you know, immerse in each of them, focus on things that speak most to you because you will end up learning more because, you know, my knowledge of each of these is very, very small. Okay, I'm just beginning to, get maybe 1%, 2%, 3%, something like that. Okay, there is a lot more to be learned about each of them. And that is the case for most of us. We are all seekers. We're trying to understand, okay? And we should follow the path which seems to give us most. At the same time, remain open to what the other people, other approaches are and learn something from them continuously asking exactly the kind of questions that you are asking, Joe, of saying, this seems to say, for example, God is regarded as head of the family. Like it's a family and you're a ch child of God. 
So God is in a different position. In the Indian tradition, you are God. You are that. That is different. Um, so so there, are, there are profound differences. Great, great point. Next up is going to be Laura, followed by Rupali. Laura. Well, this is really complicating for me because I'm a hodgepodge of infinitesimally small knowledge of anything. So, because I listen and, you know, I... There is a simple know, solution, Laura. Just ask questions. Just shut up and listen. Yeah. Okay. No, well, no, no. Not shut up and listen. Okay. All right. Ask how questions. One, how does, let's say, one rectify um, that, that you can tell me in Indian, you know, I can... Um, seek the uh, virtue and you know I know it's sort of a transitory thing and I don't have to be like smiling all the time afterwards saying how virtuous I am and versus that uh, you know the doubt and the and western certainly I I don't think I fit there either but you know I feel like I'd be on a sliding scale between here and there for sometimes yes sometimes no and I don't know if I want to land any place because I've lived all my life without having any association to anything. I've Thank made it pretty much till now and I'm going to be older soon, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is going to be Rupali. Thank you, Srikant. I think um, this talk kind of ties the one before also for me personally about leadership. Um, one thing I uh, wanted to kind of talk about was dying and being born again, whether it's the habits. And again, those, whenever you're giving up or uh, getting rid of something so that you can become better uh, at another thing, again, it has to be driven through the center, from the center with the values or the virtues that you believe in. And so in that manner, I feel it ties back to stoicism about the, all your actions driven by your virtues and the other point about leadership as i'm right let, let, let me go ahead and comment okay. on that is that okay sure, sure, sure. okay see this theme of dying and being born again appears in all these three works uh it's very clear in uh the bible you know what you're doing is that you're basically letting your lower nature die integrations that do not physical periphery which no longer which you see no longer leads to or is coming from the center that you have you have to be prepared to let it die and that is that is what is what is meant by giving up of sins sin is something that is not going to the center or is coming from the center or is going away from the center or is going orthogonal to it. It doesn't, it's not leading to the center or coming from it. That's what sin is. And that's what you have to give up. And when you do, you're born again. You're like, for example, in chapter two, Jesus talks about that you will be born again. What does he mean? So the people ask him, what do you mean born again? So he says, that means that you have a spirit in you through which you are shaping your life. So you're creating a new life for yourself. And you are doing that because you gave up other things. So there is, there is that connection. It's very much uh, there in the Tao. Again and again, Tao uses the newborn child as the model. What do they have? They have function. See, again, putting it in uh, form, you know, form follows function. Uh, it's, it's again the same thing. It's you have to let forms which are no longer supporting the function die for the function to live. So you live by getting rid of those forms and recreating new forms based on your function. That would be Louis Sullivan's way of discussing it. Um, the, the Gita way is quite sophisticated. It's simply saying is that it's a question of what your attention, where your attention is. Don't be focused on the periphery because you are attached to the things that are the, on the periphery. By simply knowing the center, 
you will destroy your karma. That's what it is saying. It's the same as by having faith in Jesus, your sins are gotten rid of. It's the same point. Because what it is saying is that because you are no longer focused on the periphery and you are doing everything based on the center, those things you have left behind. So th this theme ap applies to all, all three. Go ahead, uh, Rupali, second point. So no, I'm just saying this based on leadership that all of these points, right? Drive from the center, the outcomes will follow or don't, don't worry about whether, you know, how much money you're going to make. But if you do the right work, the right thing, money will come. I mean, all of these that you talk about in leadership comes from you. Sure. Uh, be knowledgeable or don't be willfully blind uh, comes from the same point that stay focused on. Right. I, I want to, okay. Um, I want to uh, elaborate on it in another way. Um, let's, let's increase instead of leadership, let's look at social relationships, which is a larger category of leadership. And let's see what these three people have to say. Three books have to say about that. And that's just incredibly profound. Like, so what, you know, the kind of leadership, the kind of social relations that Gita is talking about is namaste. The God in me greets God in you as the basis for leadership. Uh, not leadership, but social interaction. Okay. Um, it, it is just profound. Uh, the same thing that we saw, this was chapter seven. We're talking about river of living water. What it is saying is that when you have love in your heart for the truth and for God, it's not just flowing from you into your life. It is flowing from you like a river from which other people can drink and they will actually it will produce a river in their heart which is going to you know basically create an ocean here okay so that's that's the conception it's the same same idea okay using a different metaphor the way in which you know Lao Tzu talks about this all the time he says, if you work with the nature of people, you do nothing and they are happy and they are prosperous. It is a way of, you know, it is basically saying that you act based on the Tao, let other people act on the base of the Tao. You don't do anything and everything happens. It's, so these are three different ways of capturing the same point. Thank you, Rupali, great, great questions. Next up is going to be Joe. Folks, uh, uh, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to comment on anything or if you would like to ask questions. Go ahead, Joe. Um, something else that, that I was just trying to and I, I don't, I mean, I'm looking at the common out. I'm trying to look at the commonalities, you know, that, that what are similar. And I think integrating stoicism to this is actually very helpful. Um, primarily because it's the only one without a God. Sure. Let, let, let's so, do that. Let, let me try to, I did not fully integrate uh, stoicism. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead. You can ask a question uh, or go ahead. Go, no, you go, you do that first. Sure. sure. So, Let's try to, because what I did was that because we've been focused mostly on these three books and I have been focused mostly on these three books. So these are the three books that I ended up using, okay? But the same thing, what I realized is that the same thing applies to Stoicism, okay? Heart of Stoicism is dichotomy of control. Immediately it follows with virtue ethics. So it's saying that you can control only certain things. And then what do you do? You be virtuous. That's it. And then 
things happen as they happen. Let them. You can't do anything about them anyway. Okay. Um, so putting it in this term, so what it is doing is that it's a question of the center. So where is the center? The center is your will. What is it that you can control? It uses, they use, this, use the term control, right? What can you control? That is the core of you. That is nothing but the core of you. And all the things that you control are things that are driven from that core, that, you know, your evaluations, you know, uh, can you read the list of things that you can control? The list that you read earlier? Uh, sure. Um, give me a second. Uh, things that are in our control. Uh, some things are in our control and others are not. Uh, let me get this right to the list. Um, things in our control are opinion, per, opinion, pursuit, uh, pursuit, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever are our own actions. Yes. Things so it, yeah. No, no, no. Just, just that. Okay. So it's like, it's saying that See, center is not a static place. It's place from which you act. It is place from which you act. And that, so that is your action. Everything that proceeds from that, that is what you can control. And stoicism is all about saying, I will focus on that like a laser beam. And I will make that happen. It's the same thing of saying, act from your center. What is being focused on things you can't control? That is there on the periphery. You say, oh, that person said that to me. Oh, I wish that would have happened. What are you doing? You are getting attached to things in the periphery. So it is exactly the same point about center. Center is what you can control. It's a different formulation. And then what do you do? You be virtuous. You follow the way is the da in Tao Te Ching. Da, Tao Te Ching, the, yeah, the, the, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's what it is. And um, it is the same as virtue in Indian conception is all rooted in attention. What do you pay attention to? So pay attention to God, pay attention to your core. That is what Indian conception of virtue is because everything else follows from that. The justice is based on this namaste. You're saying, just like you focus on God in you, when you're looking at someone, don't look at just what is in their periphery. Don't look at the physical things. Don't look at their current emotions. Don't look at where they are in society. Look at the core, look at their Atma and deal with them accordingly. And that captures so much. There are so many to-dos or arts that can just flow from that. It's incredible. So that, that's how justice, you know, comes over here. The temperance, so let's look at individual virtues. So temperance, what is temperance? Temperance is saying that whatever emotions are being produced by the periphery, don't let it, don't let it take you away from the focus on what you can control. The, Indians will call it Maya. It, there is, they're saying that is like gunas, that is Rajas guna is called in Indian philosophy of saying, uh, you know, reactions to things. So don't be reactive, be proactive. You know, you're, you're acting from the center. Don't just react. So temperance, they would look at it that way. Courage is simply Express your nature, you know, make real what you are, no matter if it is hard. 
prudence is all about connecting and on prudence again the indian thought is very very complex the entire of nyana yoga is all about that that is very prominent of all these three traditions knowledge is the most prominent and is revered most in the indian tradition so prudence would match very because they they they're arguing they're you know they're going back and forth on each of those those things um so that's how i would see so we've covered all the virtues we've covered the dichotomy of control so that's how the stoicism fits in um next you can come back to this uh, if you want but let's let's go with other people and we'll we'll come back uh we'll go to um i'll i'll go with mike evanik and rupali mike what do you think uh, to me, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike. I have, I have, I have a new. I have a. I have to tell you, I have a new Zoom Zoom tool that I came up with. It's called the hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to have any time limit for you. When I find that you're going off topic or is are not being concise, I'll just do this. That means that you have 15 seconds to wrap up. So okay, so it's, it's the uh, easiest way to do it. Go ahead. All right. It's for everybody. Okay, Mike. Go ahead, All sir. right, this is for everybody. You explained that. Uh, you explained that in the first session. This oh, morning. I did not you know were. whether you were there at that time. So I, so I, 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 I didn't have anything to contribute there, as you, uh, for some reason. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, the microbiome is interesting, but no. Please uh, let, let's talk about this one, oh, Mike. Okay. Uh, all three of these things are the hero's journey. And I'm uh, in in Christianity. There's uh, there's 250 versions of the hero's journey, whether you're a Unitarian or a Mormon, which uh, the Latter Day Saints Christian journey. I, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, one, are there uh, different versions, different sects? Does a Brahmin have a different version of the Gita as compared to an untouchable? Uh, and uh, is the uh, is it uh, is it true that this is the hero's journey? And what the, the Tao is uh, say the middle way? What does that really mean as far as the concept of is the hero's journey relevant to all three? And is that a way of of uh, of charting these things, or is Brilliant. that simply uh, is that simply a way of uh, analyzing it in? in Cartesian coordinates versus analyzing it in spherical coordinates or hypo uh, geometric coordinates. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Great question. Let me go ahead and try to answer it. I've never thought about it, but let me try. Okay. Um, so hero's journey. What, what is the hero's journey? Okay. So I'm um, so let's first talk about what hero's journey is, and then let's try to relate it to this idea. F such a great question, Mike. Uh, so hero's journey, I always think of it physically, in terms of there is a city, the hero lives in the city, he leaves the city on an adventure. He goes out into the forest, faces the dragon, kills the dragon, and brings the gold back to the city. Okay, that is the, that is the loop of saying you are in a place, you see a possibility of doing something, you leave the place, you face a great conflict, and then you come back to the city, okay? So firstly, I would say that that is not, that doesn't really match very well with these core ideas. In some way it does, in some way, it seems to be a much more lower level idea, much more kind of tactical idea than the level at which this point about center and periphery is being, is being dealt with. Because what they are saying is that the hero's journey the city itself is in the periphery. 
what the hero is doing is that he's going out to a place which is slightly better in the periphery and bringing something back which moves the city little closer to the center. So it is like trying to do like a local maximization around the city, which is already in the, which is in the periphery. It is making the life better. It is doing something, but it is in that context. Now, the person, the vision that all these three have, which the hero's journey does not have, is that of a center. The Bhagavad Gita puts it in the most dramatic way. It says, Tatvamasi. That means you are God. You have everything right now with you. They say this to every individual. But you have lost your way because you're focused on the periphery. You are attached to the periphery. That's a very different kind of a journey. It is a journey of self-discovery. So, so I, I think this, these three stories are far more profound than the story of Hero's Journey. I like the story of Hero's Journey, but this is like, this is like a Beethoven symphony, a Bhagavad Gita. And compared to that, though I love, you know, love uh, good popular songs, it's a great popular, it's, it's of a different nature because this goes, this is actually a metaphysical journey of the nature of human soul um, at, at the core itself. And it is like, it gets to the, the best of the best right there, is there in the story as a character. It is not an incremental progress of making the city better. better. So I would say that this, these, all these three stories of this center and periphery are also stories which are far, but far more deeper, far more powerful, far more meaningful than the hero story, which I love, but it's, it's of a different, I think it's of a different kind. Now, in terms of the different castes, the Brahmins, the Shudras, the Vaishyas, and the Kshatriyas, what are their journeys in this? Um, and that's again a very profound thing about the Indian thought. Is um, I'm reading Bhagavad Gita, and for the first time, I'm reading just since yesterday. I've started listening to the entire Bhagavad Gita in one sitting, which is very easy to do. It's like just two hours, and you can just listen to the whole thing. Um, and the pattern that emerges is that it is saying that you have the center and you have the periphery. There are many paths that are open to you to get to the center. There is the path of karma where you do work as best as you can coming from the center with your eye closely kept on the center without getting attached to anything around you while you're doing that. That is the surest path towards the center. That's like the base. On the top of that, there is the path of Nyan, where you're trying to figure out about the nature of the core, the nature of the periphery in as crisp a term as possible. So it's the thinking part. And the point that Yogeshwar was making is that that's like two sides of the same coin. You can get to the coin by holding either one of them. And they are go both going to lead you to the same thing. There is a path of just trying to focus on the center through meditation without doing any work or this. That is very difficult because it's very easy to, be get, to think that you have something when you don't because you don't have enough feedback. Uh, but some exceptional people can still do that. 
Uh, and then there is a path of love, uh, of bhakti, of devotion, where which applies actually to uh, all, all of these things. So there are, and different people can choose whichever path seems to speak to them the most or whichever path that they are, they are better at. And the way in which the Indians think about these things is that they think about it across multiple times, multiple lifetimes. So they are saying that people will naturally be born into the families who are doing that because that is considered to be the easiest way forward, something like that. But if you look at it, uh, you know, interpret it, you know, I'm of course taking liberties here to interpret it. It's basically all these, so first thing is that all paths will lead to the same thing. And secondly, that you have to choose a path which is right for you. Um, and the Indian calculation is slightly different and that has been ritualized in a very odd way. Um, but I don't want to go into that, but that's, that's my quick answer to that. Uh, next up is going to be Evanik, Rupali, uh, Evanik and Rupali, Evanik. Yeah, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, when you were talking about um, learning all the paths and then choosing one, and to me, like the the thing is choice again. And I know I keep going back to that, but like you get to choose how to live. And I love the, that you said that because I don't think there's one path, right? So. I'm all about choosing your path. And, and I think it has to be a choice. And even in all three texts, there is a, they tell you, you make a choice. Now, the, the one thing I will admit that I don't like about the Bible is that there's a choice of hell, right? That you're making if you don't follow Jesus Christ. And I, I, I don't, I like what you said in another meetup when you said it, like the Bible is a metaphor. So when I looked at it like that, I was like, oh, I get it. It's like hell if you don't follow the center. If you are allowing the yes. periphery to drive, you, you are going through your own personal hell. You're, you're allowing materialistic things to lead you um, down a path. And it, it never works out because you're not being true to who you are. Now, Follow me to me, I love, there's beauty in all three paths that we were studying. Um, so I, I, I just think there's a path that you choose and it'll all get you to the same place as long as it's coming from your true self. I, I think that's great in choosing. And I think even if you choose one path, you can, um, you can be open to other paths and you can take the things that you like from each path, you know, you can, um, I'm still learning the Gita, so, uh, but you can take the path of, you know, working to get to the center, right? Um, and you can take, you know, the, the fountain reference from, you know, having God in you and having that fountain in you from the Bible. And, you could take flow, and I'm using the examples that I do, and you can take flow from like the water flowing and, you know, Wu Wei, which is effortless action from um, the Tao, and then incorporate it all and still get to the same place. So I, I just, I love when you said that, because I was like, that's perfect. You know, we don't have to have one bright path. There's, to me, there's no such thing as one right path is just if you're going to choose a path, choose it and live from that path. And you can choose things from different paths as long as you're true to yourself. Wonderful. I want to comment on a couple of things here. Um, great, great comments. Um, I mean, one thing that I'm astonished by is that each of these books actually is very different than its reputation of like the, the, the way in which people have applied these books over history, I think they have lost a lot of the core meaning. These books are far, far deeper, far more profound. 
than how people have seen, you know, people are applying them. So most religious people, unfortunately, are using too much of the ritual and are trying to kind of do many things with these books, which are not there in the books, which are, you know, so, so that's one thing. So just kind of communing with the books themselves, they speak a lot more. So for example, um, the point that you're making about that Jesus being the way, so the, the idea that if you go away from the center, you're going away from the center. That means you're going, doing something which is destructive to you, you know, at the core of your being, and that's going to hurt you. Uh, and that's just how it is. Um, so, so that that point, I think, uh, you know, it's it's amazing. So thank you. That, that's all I wanted to um, highlight. Let me go ahead. Uh, so next up is going to be Rupali, uh, Cheryl, and Jang. Rupali. So Shrikant, I'm going to piggyback on what Devani and you were saying a little bit on what Joe said before. Um, I have four columns in my notes right now, and there are the three religious philo they become religious over time. I don't know if they started as a religion, but those are three philosophies uh, to approach life as Taoism, Hinduism, and uh, the and Christian uh, philosophy. And then you have the non-religious and I have Louis Sullivan and Ayn Rand and Stoicism under mm -hmm. those in that column. And the thing is not being religious, not wanting to be dogmatic, uh, what are the value? I mean, how do we compare the non-religious uh, philosophies to the three ancient philosophies uh, to carve out a new philosophy for yourself? Like, so for example, how do we leave, lead our lives if we don't particularly follow any one of those three religions? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the beautiful thing, uh, Rupali, is that what I'm finding is that there are these commonalities. They're saying the same thing. It's like, for example, form follows function actually captures this. It's the same as saying periphery follows the center. It is identical statement because function center is not passive. It is the, it is the fountain, you know, that's the, that's the core. You know, it is flowing through that. Everything is the result of that. Tao is not sitting there. It is actually creating the periphery. So that's the function. Or, you know, Atma, God in the Indian tradition is the cause of everything. It's the, everything is the cause of the love that is there in the Christian tradition. You know, love of God for the world, love of Jesus for us, our love for our neighbors, our love for ourselves, all of that together is producing everything. So like form follows function is identical to, to this. And it, it actually captures it. I think that's one of my favorite formulations of, of all of this, because he actually goes, when you, when you actually look at Louis Sullivan's writings, all of these levels are there within him. He's talking about the spiritual nature. He's talking about the intellectual nature, the emotional nature, the physical nature, the social nature. And how are these all integrated with each other? And he's saying, as far as I can see, he's saying the same thing across. Um, thank you. Next up is Jeng followed by Cheryl. Jeng. Yeah, I really like this uh, this comparison and also I think the only challenge I have is with Bible somehow. I really resonate with Tao Te Ching and also even some of the stoicism. Can, and you, also, can you very uh, briefly, uh, concisely tell me what yeah. problem you see with the Bible? And let me see if I can. Oh, yeah, actually I've analyzed myself. I think the, the problem is I have is the, the only way and our storytelling way and somehow I'm very against authority somehow. That's why I work by myself. So what, what you reason. should do, what you should do is that you should look at our Bible, you know, our, uh, you know, uh, gospel. Yeah, of John I, I joined Christ. once. Yeah, I joined a couple of times. And those, yeah. those, that's what I mean. Unfortunately, the thing is that I, I, I sympathize with what you're saying, okay? <laughs> because what happens is that 
lot of religion and this is true not just not just for the bible it's just that you we are here where bible is a predominant you go to india the way we are approaching gita people would think that that's not religious that's not gita it's like no 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 you have to do this you, you can't you know it's it is far more restrictive yeah uh and traditional so what happens is that the rituals get built in rituals habits social institutions get built on the top of these texts and those texts those are the ones which are rigid and mm -hmm. jesus is complaining exactly about the same thing in the new testament he says what do you mean sabbath you know will you let your sheep die if they fall in the well because it's on the sabbath day no you know function comes first you know you have to do the right thing uh so it's it's the same issue of i think a uh, ritual so i would say kind of going back and looking at the text um you know uh, and that's exactly what we're doing so that that's what i would recommend and at least yeah. i'm seeing the same kind of patterns and and but there there are differences though so i yeah, look forward I, to exploring I with, exploring that mm -hmm. yeah i agree with a lot of with that actually and uh, and but and also with the limited time i have to choose limited sure. way sure yeah but sure. i want to say i fully agree with you know one day but i was reading Tao Te Ching long time ago and i was trying to have this revolution revolution or whatever i suddenly realized that everybody's talking exactly the same thing you know they just trying to describe this universal law yep. and every we see it just a symptom of that in the that law and they describe in different angles like oh my god are they writing exactly the same thing and just from different perspective looking at this universal law so that i think that's what why when we look at the ancient you know book they all get more essence of that thing and they have so many similarities because it's all about the same thing anyway excellent thank you thank you jeng next up is cheryl um and I just wanted to get your opinion on um, the center, whether, whether just on this idea of the center being the source of goodness or godliness, and that's what you want to attach to, versus the periphery being of sin and evil of the material world and being unattached to that. Um, I know that the, the good and evil, like the path to a good life, no, no, no. Uh, let, let, let me, but what am I confusing? I feel like I'm a little confused. Um, Maybe so, it's not a valid example. No, no, no. Let me uh, let, let me clarify one thing, and then I will I will have you kind of restate uh, what you say. I, I'm not saying that periphery is bad, and the center is good. In fact, exactly opposite. I'm saying that center and periphery both exist. Center is always good, and periphery is good to the extent to which it flows from and flows to the center because the life is coming from the center. The periphery is form. So are things that are created and it's only when the periphery is supporting the center by flowing to it and flowing from it that it is good. When it is flowing against it or irrespective of it, then it is hurtful. Um, so, uh, so, I'm, so th that's what I'm saying. That I mean, and and this integration of the center with the periphery is the crucial, crucial part of all these three philosophies. So you're saying that Jesus is hundred percent man, hundred percent God. So he's living example. He is the periphery by being the man but he is the center by being god so he is a great example of the ideal ideal which is manifested ideal manifested is periphery which is coming from the center and going to the center. So that's, that's, and that as opposed 
to things in the periphery which are going against the center or going somewhere else. That, that's what I'm talking about. I don't know whether this is clearer or not. Or, or can you ask your question again? Yes, that does help because I was thinking of the overriding principle so much in the Bible is the, is the good versus the evil world and um, the idea of attachment and sin. And I hear the word sin in all these, all these um, or the idea of sin in all these um, philosophies too. So I was just kind of wondering where that resided or, and that's why I was trying to put it in the periphery. Right, exactly. So it is, the, it is only the part of periphery which is going away from the center or going. So if, it's, if you look at it as a circle, if it is going away from the center, so it is on the periphery, the things on the periphery, only some of the things in the periphery are bad and some of the things are good. The things that are good are coming from the center and going to the center and supporting the center and are being inspired by or driven by the center. Those are good things. There are things which are bad, which are going against in the opposite direction of the center or are going in some other direction, which is like parallel. It's kind of going round and round without going towards the center. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the distinction. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, next up is Jack had a very interesting question. He was saying, but isn't Hero the center, not the city? Okay, that's a very interesting question. The hero's journey as defined, it's always involves a city. That's why I included the city in, in that. Um, the hero, so, and, and I, I like that conception that, you know, man is an individual and social at the same time. Um, so that's, that's the conception, but even at the individual level, let me think, um, I mean, one way to think about this is that you can think of all these things, um, as external or internal. Okay. You can think of these things as external or internal. So there are things in you, your thoughts, your emotions, your habits, which are part of you as an individual, which are either supporting your center, the core of your being or not. And there is a, there is a dynamic of that. And that too is kind of center and, and periphery. So in hero's journey, because it is typically held together, but Jack, if you want to uh, elaborate on your question, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if anybody else has any comments or questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark. I do. Uh, Laura, what's your question? Well, it's following exactly on what she was talking about, thinking of the human, you know, the, the human as the center. And so that there'll be moments where it will <clears throat> not all the elements or people will be long to that so some will be left behind yes. and so that you get basically gradations in your social system essentially what comes out of it and it's also about education because at that point somebody somehow wants to move these people into a new situation then yeah unfortunately uh, laura um i mean the thing is that uh, let's not go too much into the education system because i don't think like in order to actually or, educate people just oral you know just conversationally not or not a system of education but just through um oral communication that they will potentially have the potential to move next time that there is such a, 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 see, that's the point. It's like, when would there be, when is it occurring that, you know, the center looks to, is it like every day that they look to bring people? Is it after a month of time? You know, is there a, a limit to when they look to bring new, sure. new individuals sure. in that part that's tricky? But I really see that as an evolving kind of revolving kind of thing that goes on. Got it. And Thank you. Let, let me go ahead and respond to it, uh, Laura. Um, so, so when you look at 
kind of education, right? How does this transmission of these ideas happen? So firstly, the education that we are talking about is very deep. Okay, we're talking about people. This is the same thing that uh, Krishna is telling Arjun. Look, this is what you need to learn. This is the same thing of saying, okay, how to be a sage. This is the same thing of saying, having that living water in you. What does that look like? That education, that transmission. Firstly, in order to do that, the people who are doing the education need to have that. If you don't have that, you can't do, you can't do that. You can't do you can't transmit it to other people. Uh, I think like lots of people in education are in that situation that they don't, themselves do not have the virtue. They themselves do not have the, the approach. Uh, so their ability to transmit is not. That's one part of it. The second part of it, which is again repeated in the Bible again and again, and it's also repeated in uh, Gita, is that that person has to want to drink. Only if they are thirsty, it will work. Uh, you can do something. It's not a question of just transmitting mechanism. So firstly, the so first point I'm making is that you have to have something to transmit, which most people do not have. Number two, there have to be people who, are, who actually want, who are thirsty, which most people are not. Okay, and that's the problem. So, the, so it's far deeper uh, issue than that. Uh, next up is Jack. Jack, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, when Mike brought up the question about the hero's journey, the thing that that um, kind of popped into my head was, um, and I haven't read it, right? Um, but John Campbell's um, a thousand um, hero of a thousand faces or something along those lines, and I I automatically remembered there was like kind of like a cyclical chart that essentially explained the hero's journey. I've, I've got in front of me, or mm -hmm. at least a simple, uh, simple version of it. And it's basically like, there's a call to adventure. Um, there's a threshold where there is a guardian, a mentor. Um, there's an abyss, right? Death and rebirth, transformation, atonement, and then eventually return. Um, it says gift of goddess, but essentially return to the beginning. And so how I connect that to, um, you know, what, what you're talking about is like, you know, Arjun is essentially kind of like on an inner hero's journey with the Tao, you know, it's the concept of returning to the root. And with stoicism, you know, um, you'd brought up uh, courage uh, as expressing your nature. Oh, but right? uh, uh, so, Jack, let, let, let me ask you a question. So where do you see yeah. the center in it? The, my, my objection to... Looking at the hero's journey, I see it as a relative thing of saying that the hero was in one place. He took the challenge. He suffered. He succeeded. And he improved his state and that of his city. So it's all a relative loop. What I'm saying is that all these three are looking at something which is metaphysical, which is a deeper issue than the this loop of hero's journey that's what i was saying yeah and, and i was just thinking i mean in terms of the hero and the so i i never like when i think about hero's journey i never really think about it in terms of a city or the peripheral it's really about the hero and so it's really about the hero being the center the periphery is everything else it's the world right um and it's it's a matter of like almost like he's got to overcome his own you know essentially come to a level of wisdom Right, uh, kind of like with the Stoics and, and and some of the virtues that are attained in order to, or you know, in some of these other cases, essentially attaining a light enlightenment, right, through struggle. And so that's why I think about the hero as the center. Sure, no, no, you can validly do that. The thing is that, uh, but in, even if you look at, I, I agree, you can validly look at it, hero, uh, hero's journey from just the hero point of view, hero's point of view, that he was in a certain state himself. He went out, did something, took took risks, suffered, won, and is now in a better place. So this is all about, or what I'm saying is that it is all about incremental journey. What all these three are saying is that there is a metaphysical issue here, that there is a human will, a human potential, which is incredibly powerful, which is the core, you know, which, so, so it is, so that's the distinction I was making. Uh, Rupali. 
I'll just piggyback on that. Um, the hero's journey. So the hero um, has virtues and values, which is why they are willing to take that journey because there is an aim or there's a goal that they uh, want to accomplish and have the courage to do it. But that is only one instance in the life of the heroes, uh, in, in the life of the hero. It's that one journey. It's not the way of life. It's not everyday living, which is what these three books are trying to teach. It's not just one journey you take in your life. And that's how I feel it's different from, that's why I feel that the hero, hero's journey is not um, the same as looking at the Gita, the Bible, or the Tao. Sure. Um, I also want to make one more connection. In some sense, the heroism in the Bible, Gita, and Tao Te Ching is far more profound. It is asking a lot more of the hero. It is saying that you actually have to be God, okay? And if you're not God, you're missing something. So that the standard of heroism that is provided by all these three is actually much, much higher than what is posited in, in, the, uh, in Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey. Um, so it is very much kind of hero's journey that is hero, but it's far more, uh, far more higher. All right. Um, all right, folks. So just, I want to get the feedback of how you thought the meetup was. So go ahead and type an exclamation mark. If you want to tell me um, how, how it went, whether it was clear what I said, um, whether the uh, questions I was able to answer, um, what are you taking away from it? Uh, any thoughts? Any thoughts would be appreciated. Um, so it's going to be Joe followed by Evanique. Joe. That was excellent. I mean, it's given me a lot to uh, to think about um, from a number of levels, just the the commonalities and just some of the differences as well that as I had noted. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of see the commonalities clearly, uh, uh, but seeing some of the differences and nuances and the details, I think that it'll help me when we're covering these three works in the next week. I mean, a lot. That's a what lot. I was hoping. That was, that's what I was hoping for, because what I, will happen is that this is just a beginning of kind of us beginning to see connections between these. Right. And I think it'll be deeper. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Joe. No, and I, I think that this, along with the video that um, Rupali had put in the, in the chat, is going to be very, very helpful uh, for, uh, for, for me going forward. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciated this a great deal. And it also, at some point, may have given me an idea for another meetup that okay. I could bring up to you. But it it would have it would be I'm still forming it, sure. uh, but it's just this whole role of God and versus you know supernatural versus not supernatural. Anyway, I'll Wonderful. talk I'll talk to you about. It. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique, Rupali, Cheryl, and Jack. Evanique. Uh, yeah, I found this fascinating. Um, you sucked me in, <laughs> Shrikanta. I wasn't planning on attending this one. <laughs> and it just got sucked right in. Um, and I have I, to go I through. use I use Joe as a means to do that. I knew I know <laughs> that you like Joe a lot. And I said I I have to quickly talk about something so that you know go, go ahead. Sorry. We can't blow up his head now. Come on. No, but seriously, um I, I wasn't really planning on it, but I am glad I did. Um this was an amazing talk. I think um really looking at them together really does help you see the the common paths and I think people bringing up the differences is great and um, I would love to hear everybody else but I'm gonna have to hop off at five because sure. I have my own zoom call at five that's sure. going in on this line sure. I, I want to tell you like I really appreciate your all your knowledge of the bible and that is helping me and everybody else a lot so all you know we are all making connections so great thank you next thank up, you I'll see you tonight See him. Uh, next up is Rupali, Cheryl, and Jack. Rupali. Uh, thank you, Shrikant. This uh, 
much like Kevin Nick said, I was supposed to only be there at 12 o'clock and I'm here five hours <laughs> later. And it reminds me of the chats we used to have many, many, many years ago, uh, where we would spend the entire day chatting. And uh, I always left, you know, more knowledgeable and I still feel the same today. Uh, the center and periphery, it also helped me kind of focus on what's important for me right now and bring all of that together through the Tao and the Gita, the Bible, as well as uh, from Louis Sullivan's outlook. And thank you, Joe, for uh, a wonderful presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Next thank up you. is Cheryl, followed by Jack. Cheryl. Yes, I, I always come away from these sessions on the commonalities, wanting to attend more of the sessions you have on the different uh, books, because um, I think we, we talk about so much division in society today that I'm learning a lot about different cultures and different ways of thinking. And uh, looking at the commonalities is just a wonderful way of bridging um, what we think is, is so divisive in society. So I really appreciate these. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Cheryl. And the good news is that actually all three meetups are doing amazingly well. You know, Tao Te Ching meetups, um, the Gospel of John meetups, and starting last time, the Gita meetups are just incredible now. So just just have a you know, um, and uh, uh, by the way, all of these meetups are on YouTube. So you can go to YouTube, uh, search for 52 Living Ideas, and you can find playlists for all these meetups. So you can uh, look at anything that you missed uh, at any point of time. Next up is Jack. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to thank you for, for hosting this and coming up with this idea. I mean, this is really amazing, this connection between the three and then also incorporating stoicism. Um, it's got me thinking in a number of different areas. Like lately, I've been reading about... Um, neuroscience but there's a whole idea about like um a choice you know essentially the idea of the um the center and the periphery and, and you know across the, all the themes there's this commonality of the choice or or you know as victor frankel would say between stimulus and response there's a space yes. and that space is our power to choose a response and our, and our response in that response lies our growth and freedom and so there's a space there's a choice there's in neuroscience they talk about veto power as part of an action a response to action potential so anyway there's all these connections and and i thought that how you presented this information was like was amazing uh i've written a lot of notes and, and i'm going to be thinking about this for a little while <laughs> thank you wonderful thank you thank you jack really appreciate that thank you uh next up is going to be jeng followed by joe jeng yeah this is uh quite fascinating I mentioned I was always going to different churches, Buddha temples, trying to find this way, and it doesn't work for me. And finally, I found five good living idea, and they actually provide all these options exactly what I'm looking for, you know. And I really want to further study the Tao Te Ching and the Bible Gita, and maybe more Bible, and also Stoicism. I think all this helped me to form my my own understanding and kind of my own philosophy. I think it's individualized education is what it's about you know we no longer have to use one solution for every student every student have their own learning way and i think this is the spiritual path why different options is the best opportunity for people to find their own way thank you wonderful thank you thank you jeng next up is going to be joe joe go ahead yeah i just wanted to say i agree with you the the gita meetups are actually maybe have surpassed the Tao ones, but don't yes, tell, yes, don't yes, mention yes. that. Don't mention that tonight. I won't bring no, that up. I'm not going to bring that up to Amon and Jason. But, I'm being, but, but I'm being honest. No, no, you know, no, no Yogi no. Shore has brought, he's brought everything to all three meetups. He, he attends all three. Yeah. And actually captures all three. Yeah. But the thing is that it, it is really remarkable. Okay. I mean, what what is going on with what happened with the uh, Gita meetup right. last time? because what it is, is that he is really studying this, Gita, okay? Like nobody else studies the Bible or Tao Te Ching, okay? Like, for example, he not only has learned Sanskrit for it, he learned Sanskrit just to read this. He's reading all the major commentaries throughout history on Gita, written in Sanskrit, 
And he's comparing all of them and he is talking about that. So that's the level at which he's going. At the same time, he is very simple. You know, he's a seeker, he's trying to learn and that's exactly the right attitude. Like I am going to make this point um, in the meetup um, next time, hopefully if I have time, but I, let me make it here. It's Krishna and Arjun, okay? You have to always put yourself in the place of Arjun. You are yeah. Arjun, okay? You have your life to live. You have your choices to make. Krishna is your friend, okay? He's your best friend and he's telling you something. You can see the amount of love that Krishna has for Arjun and vice versa. You can see the clarity with which Arjun is asking him questions. He says, look, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. You're, make, you're saying this and then you're saying that. So this entire process of dialogue, of discovery, very openly asking questions about with no fear whatsoever, no ignorance is looked down upon, okay? That tradition is the Indian tradition of learning that you try to learn. Now, that has been lost in modern days. Modern days, yeah. people don't do it that much. So that way, the, what we are doing is very Indian in the old tradition. This is also the tradition of people like Aquinas when they were studying. It was like that. Lao Tzu is also like that. Okay, so this is like the old way of studying these works at their time. That's what we are doing. And what Yogeshwar brings is that he brings that deep knowledge. Now, luckily, I understand it enough that I can understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm spending enormously more amount of time studying Gita as a result of that, that I can actually understand him at no matter what he's saying. And I have the advantage of that I understand the audience better, which he doesn't understand, right? So I'm able to understand what he's saying. I'm able to say, okay, how are people seeing this? And add whatever is needed as and when that I see. And then definitely when questions come in, I'm able to add things where I can try right. to bridge that gap. And because the distance between the Indian thought and the Western thought is so large that this is where we actually have to do it really well. And I right. have struggled to do it. For the first time, I feel good about the, about the Gita meetups. You should. Um, so thank you. Uh, Laura, what did you think of the meetup? We just started talking about that, okay? Yeah, no, I really think it's fantastic. Um, I was sort of a hardline stoic kind of thing person. And this is really opening up horizons for me that it's just amazing. Wonderful, I'm thank you. i the world a different way. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, all right, folks. Thank you very much. Um, I want to tell you that this is only number three of the four meetups, the fourth meetup is at 8 p.m. And that's going to be on the topic of the experience of translating Tao, Tao De Jing, Tao De Jing, uh, you know, Jason and Amon have been doing such a spectacular job of doing the translations. So I'm going to interview them about their experience doing the translation. And then we are going to read nine of the verses just to hear what Jason's translation looks like when it is just read out as a whole. And then we are going to discuss that. So hope you can make it. All right. Thank you again. See you folks soon. Bye.